Fast forward to today, 30 years later, less than 8% of the world's population lives in extreme poverty. In India, the change was even more dramatic. It went from roughly 50% in 1987 to today it's less than 3%. The World Bank doesn't distinguish between less than 3% and anything below 3%. India has the same rate of extreme poverty as the United States or Sweden or Switzerland or Japan or any other high income country around the world. This transformation, oh, and let me say, China is in the same situation. In the 1980s, half of the population of China was in extreme poverty. Today, less than 3%. That's something that India and China have in common. It is arguably the greatest transformation in human history, at least in terms of income, to go from a situation where half of the population or more is at a subsistence level, and within one generation, it goes to a situation where that level of poverty is extremely rare. It's something that you who've grown up in India have witnessed. It's something that I think is probably very difficult to explain to your children and to your grandchildren the changes that you have seen. That's something that India and China share in common. But those two countries got to this situation in a very different way. China has a very centralized economy, a very strong central government, a government that looks, monitors what people do. India is very different. This is a very free and open society. The government doesn't monitor each individual. The government doesn't use the internet to monitor exactly what you're doing. The Indian government doesn't have a social rating system that rates each individual. China does. China has had spectacular economic growth over the past 30 years, but its economy is slowing. It's actually slower growth now than India. India is somewhere between the fifth and seventh largest economy in the world, but it's growing faster than all of the economies that are larger than it. One of the things I love about India is that you have a financial press that has very high expectations. You have a financial press that says, economic growth fell below 6%. This is unacceptable. We need faster economic growth. I come from a country, the United States, that is so complacent. We have an economy that struggles in the 2% range, and the financial press says, oh, this is wonderful. This is great. You're doing great. Keep it up. Because the lower economic growth is, the lower interest rates are. And the lower interest rates are, the higher the return on various equities. That's not the attitude here in India. You want high economic growth. And high economic growth is This is great. This, this, this reminds me of home and you know, <laughs> electricity goes out. The way out of poverty, and I don't mean to suggest for half a second that poverty has been eradicated in India or anywhere around the world. The difference between living on 300 rupees and 100 rupees a day is absolutely enormous. But 300 rupees is still an extreme, is still very bad poverty. It's not the extreme form of poverty, but it's a very bad form of poverty. The way that people have gotten out of poverty in the past 30 years is a combination of things. It's, it's been better health care, better water, uh, more electricity, but it's this. 
And this, my personal view is wireless technology has been the most transformative technology possibly in human history. It has made it, a lot of it has to do with just quality of life. It means you can talk to your parents if they're in a different city. You can talk to friends somewhere else. India has approximately 1.2 billion line, wireless lines in a country of 1.3 billion. It's roughly one per person. That's the same as in any advanced country in the world. That doesn't mean that there are 1.2 billion people who have wireless lines. Some people have three, four, five. But in, any, in the poorest of the poor neighborhoods in India or anywhere in the world, you will find people with these devices. And people who don't own them, everybody knows someone who does. And this makes their life very different. It means they can talk to, to friends and family, that's great. But it also gives them job opportunities they never had before. It means someone tells them, you know, they need some workers in the next city tomorrow morning, can you be there? And then you go there and you got work that you wouldn't have had otherwise. You find out that the price of rice is in the next town is such and such today. That means you can adjust the price of rice that you're selling from your small plot today. It means that you can operate more efficiently and that's essentially how economies grow. It's about adding value, it's about doing things more efficiently. And with each passing generation of wireless technology, it has enabled people to run their lives more efficiently. It's enabled businesses to operate more efficiently. But I am absolutely convinced it's made more of a difference in the lives of the poorest of the poor than it has the richest of the rich. The richest of the rich are always rich. They always do well. If they're efficient, they're even more rich. If they're not as efficient, they're still rich. But for the poorest of the poor, being efficient is the difference between having a better opportunity tomorrow and not having a better opportunity tomorrow. And having more efficiency over time means that your children have better opportunities in the future than you had in the past. So being efficient is really important. It's made a big difference both here in India and in China. And these two countries have accounted for well over, between you, I would say over a billion people have transformed from being in extreme poverty to something above extreme poverty. That's extraordinary. But you've done it in different ways. You've done it in different ways with different governments in different ways of looking at things. And guess what? They both worked. I'm not here to tell you the Chinese system didn't work. Economically, China has done extraordinarily well over the past 30 years. It's gone from one of the poorest countries in the world to very much of a middle class country. But India has done the same and in a very different way. And it's done it in a way that has not focused on a central government that is very focused on controlling people. It's done in a way that has not been based on a central government that is very focused on security issues in the same way that, that, that China is. I'm, I'm not here to discuss the specific security issues in India or China. I, I'm not an expert on, on either of those. But I am here to tell you that these devices, these transformative devices, these efficiency devices that make everyone's life that much more efficient are, have been very important in the past and will continue to be even more important in the future. We have a new generation, 5G, that uh, is being introduced in countries around the world and will be introduced here in India at some date. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, whether it's next year or the year after, or the year after that. But at some point, 5G will also come to India. And with it are gonna come more efficiency opportunities. 
What is 5G? 5G simply is going to be more data transmitted more rapidly with less latency. But it, it's going to, and if you think about the activities that you can't quite do with your 4G phone or your 3G phone or your 2G phone, those are things that 5G will be able to do. It's going to, uh, some, some examples will be um, transportation section, sector, autonomous vehicles, vehicles that will be able to talk to each other with massive amounts of information to avoid accidents. Uh, it could be the electric utility sector being able to manage renewable energy in combination with carbon power plants um, to, to match demand loads in, in real time rather than to, having to guess uh, when to turn off the, the carbon powered fuel plant. It's going to mean healthcare services that can be provided remotely, say from here in Hyderabad to a rural village, um, to uh, be able to look at uh, um, screens uh, and to, to diagnose patients in real time. Um, it, it's going to mean a lot of different things in a lot of different sectors. Exactly what those are, no one knows for sure. In the same way that when, when 3G and 4G were first announced and first introduced, no one had any idea about the development of social media. No one had any idea about the development of Uber and real-time uh, car sharing services. No one had any idea about the countless thousands of applications that have been developed based on the capabilities of 3G and 4G. In the same way, no one has any idea about the full extent of applications that will be developed with 5G. And six or seven years from now, 6G. But there is a dark side to technology. It's not all, it's not all good. And there are two elements that are particularly challenging uh, with, um, with new wireless technologies. And I put these in two categories. Uh, one is what I call espionage, uh, and that covers a wide range of things where a third party collects information about you without your knowledge or without your consent. And the other is what I would call sabotage, where bad actors can use our dependence on these new wireless technologies to cause havoc, to um, shut services down, or to uh, reduce their efficiency in some way. And this is where security comes in. Um, it's really important in thinking about the development of new wireless technologies to have ways of protecting consumers, uh, whether you're in the poorest of the poor or not, uh, from these opportunities for, um, uh, for sabotage and for espionage. I'm not saying that either of those is new. They've existed with all forms of wireless technology. Uh, and they're very serious problems. We all know about privacy data breaches. Just in the United States last week, it was revealed that a computer hacker, who wasn't a foreign government, who wasn't a terrorist organization, it was simply a former computer programmer at Amazon, as a hack, decided to download information about 150 million American financial accounts. That's, that's a serious problem. It's a serious problem of espionage. We've had a series of these in the United States, despite massive amounts of efforts to block espionage. Sabotage has gone on as well. Um, the Russian government, probably the Russian government, uh, from time to time shuts down the wireless system in, in the Ukraine, shuts down the electric system. Uh, there are bad actors out there who, who can use wireless services for bad purposes. Security is a different matter in a free and open society like India than it is 
in a society like China where the government is very powerful. Security in an open society is a way of protecting consumers, not so much the government, but protecting consumers from bad actors. In a strong centralized government such as China, the government is doing that every day. They're taking acts. They don't let people have free access to the internet. They monitor what people do. And if a bad actor is around, um, they're probably not around for very long. It's a very different way of operating a society. But security with new technologies actually matters more in a free and open society. And that's why I think it matters, should matter a lot here in India. It matters a lot in the United States. It's something that, that we think about a lot, um, both in terms of espionage and in terms of sabotage. I'm happy that that's, uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak for too terribly long. I much prefer to hear your questions uh, get a conversation going. I don't have answers to a lot of questions, and I'll tell you if I don't have an answer. And I may turn the table and ask you all questions and flip it back on you. Uh, but what I wanted, I, I, I wanted to tell you my message about why I think uh, this 5G technology and wireless technology is really important here in India. It's done a lot of wonderful things. Uh, you all should be very proud of the progress that your country has made and the progress it will continue to make. Uh, just as a final thought, if India grows at this terribly low rate of 6% a year, in 12 years you will have doubled the economic activity of the country. Now, there is some population growth, but if you think about the poorest of the poor who have escaped from say 100 rupees a day to 300 rupees a day, there's every reason to think that in another decade or so, they'll be up to 600 rupees a day. That is just extraordinary. Uh, and so it's really important to keep the economic growth going. And I think the best way to keep the economic growth going is, is with expanding wireless services. So thank you very much. CIA uh, and the U.S. government was using the top four companies to spy on millions of American citizens. My question is, is any of the Indian citizens, because we're talking about 1.3 billion people on the radar as well? You, you have news to me. I'm happy to learn about it. Uh, I'm completely unaware of what you just told me. Uh, I'm happy to learn about it. There was a, a news item in the today's paper that the congressman Jim Banks has uh, told India that uh, they should not go in for 5G provided by ZTE or Huawei because the security interests of US will be compromised. Uh, well, how is it that the US security gets compromised if India goes in for 5G provided by China? Uh, well, first of all, there are 535 members of Congress, 435 in the House, 100 in the Senate. Um, I'm not a member of Congress. I can't speak for any one of them, uh, and, and I, I don't speak for the, for the U.S. government. Um, uh, security issues are decisions that the government of India will have to decide for itself. Uh, so I, I'm not here to defend anything that a, that a member of Congress has said. Um, uh, there, there is, I will say there is bipartisan concern though in the United States about security related to Chinese technology. Uh, this is not a partisan issue. The ban on Huawei equipment, network equipment, 
for the four major carriers began in 2010 under President Obama. Um, and it's one of, I'd say, the very few issues uh, on which there's very strong bipartisan support. My name is Surya Tirikuta and I'm a smart city So my question is not on 5G but on something else that concerns really India and other countries which is the uh, energy storage mineral resource, lithium and cobalt. Uh, China is taking effectively the control of the lithium and cobalt resources by you know from Congo and other places. So how do you think like you know uh, what do you think like the world is going to shape up and how the US is going to counter uh, the China most particularly on the energy security issues? So, so the question is about uh, control of specific mineral resources, particularly in some cases rare earth metals, but even other, other uh, mineral resources. Um, Let me give two answers. And the first answer is, this is not an area that I know a particularly large amount, so take what I have to say with a grain of sodium or a grain of whatever. I, I'm not, uh, not an expert on it. But to some extent, it, this is uh, an issue of uh, global markets. So there are global markets for the trade in various uh, minerals, including rare earth minerals rare earth metals, and um, uh, a, a lot of them, uh, they're not really dictated entirely or possibly even in part by national governments. I am aware that the Chinese government has made efforts to uh, acquire mineral rights in various countries, including here in India. Um, uh, whether that's affected the availability of minerals in a competitive market, I, I don't know. I don't know whether they've been able to corner the market, so to speak, or not. Uh, who owns the 5G technology? Question one. Is it only the Chinese companies which own the 5G technology, or is it owned by uh, someone in the West? <laughs> Is 5G a monopoly of the Chinese or are there other vendors of, 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 of 5G products? And if it is only China that uh, one has to depend upon, uh, what would happen if countries ban Chinese purchase? Would 5G just get ordered? First of all, I, it's a great question, and, and let me just give a bit of background. Uh, the prior four generations of wireless technology all had the following characteristics. Network equipment was designed, developed, and manufactured competitively uh, by a lot of different companies around the world. Handset equipment was designed, developed, and competitively marketed by many companies around the world. Um, applications were competitively developed. Uh, wireless providers in national markets tended to be competitive. In all of those instances, uh, national governments were really not very present. There was a consensus among governments around the world when it comes to wireless technology. Hands off. Don't, don't mess with a good thing. 5G has been a little different. Uh, 5G is, has been a strategic imperative of the Chinese government, much like the Belt and Road Project. I would argue 5G has been much, much, much more successful for China than the Belt and Road Project has been. Having said that, there still are, 5G is competitively provided. There are uh, other competitors, uh, Ericsson in Sweden, Nokia from Finland, Samsung from Korea. All of those have a fairly complete suite of uh, 
network equipment products. Uh, Samsung, I believe, has a contract here with Geo for as their provider of uh, technology. Having said all of that, it's it's not that a network, a piece of network equipment, or a handset, or any piece of equipment related to wireless technology is simply a box that has just one company's technology in it, or even one company's technology in it. Um, this iPhone has about 700 patented components in it. Some of those components have multiple patents on them. Those patents are held by hundreds of different companies around the world, some of which are Huawei, some of which are a lot of different other countries, companies. Um, you, I like to think of the electronic manufacturing in, industry as you start with very small widgets and you put the small widgets together to form bigger widgets and then you put the bigger widgets together to form bigger widgets still and at some point you have an end product but it's after lots and lots of layers of widgets. Huawei is the largest manufacturer of electronic widgets in the world but their suppliers are lots of other electronic manufacturing companies around the world and their customers are lots of other electronic manufacturing customer companies around the world. So that's a long-winded way of answering your question. The general answer is yes, there are competitors for 5G technology um, if, uh, and if a country decided they didn't want to deal with one company, they could deal with others. Of all of the providers of 5G technology, the one company I'm absolutely certain is going to survive no matter what is Huawei. They have contracts in dozens of countries around the world. They're doing very well. They're doing very well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Divakar. I run an IT services company. Uh, take in the late 90s and all, we were not so secure and our data was like a very easy accessible. But as the technology grow, now we have black tape coming in, which has proved a robust with Bitcoin and the kind of the transactions it is able to handle today. So when we protect the data with a very robust security, probably we may have further scale of the type of security and other things. But still, is it going to be a problem with the data accessible to everybody? As you know far better than I, there are lots of ways of providing cybersecurity, um, and a, a lot of those ways are different layers of the internet, everything from the physical layer all the way up to the final application and user layer. Um, all of those cybersecurity techniques add complexity, they add costs, they slow things down a bit. Um, but at the same time, they're valuable to customers. That's why people pay to have the cybersecurity. That's going to continue with 5G as well. I don't know if that's answering your question or not, but that's. Good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, I would like to know uh, what are the Sure. As I understand the question, you're saying um, uh, there's security concerns at all different levels, from handsets to network equipment to applications. Um, those are those are all very important, and um, I think we have to be concerned about cybersecurity in in each of those levels. Um, it's it's not just one. Um, and uh, 
I, I do think 5G is going to complicate matters further in, in two ways. One is, um, particularly with higher frequency uh, uses, you're going to have transceivers that can go only 50 to 100 meters and they're going to be ubiquitous around an urban area. They're going to be on every wall of every street. Uh, and um, they're going to provide wonderful service, but their ubiquity is going to make them very difficult to provide physical protection to them. It's going to be opportunities both for um, espionage and, and for sabotage in ways that when you have just a few cell towers, it's a lot harder to do that. The other is that 5G will be integrated into the facilities and devices within uh, within sectors of the economy in ways that we haven't seen before. And so the, the boundaries right now between a telecom service as distinct from healthcare, education, energy, transportation, those boundaries I think are going to be increasingly blurry over time as telecommunication services become embedded inside of equipment. Good evening, sir. My name is Shida. I have two questions. One yeah. short, short question. The short question is, are there any side effects of uh, IG that users should be worried about? Because some of the countries have uh, said no to IG trials. That's the first question. Mm -hmm. Second question is, uh, there is a new emerging view that uh, the genesis of the trade wars initiated by Trump it is because of the stealth technology stealing by Chinese companies the entire artificial intelligence race and technology transfers have been uh, going on by Chinese yeah. immigrants in America, right. uh, transporting it back to China. So if that is the case, and Indians per se trust Americans more than Chinese, uh, what would be your advice? Considering that bulk of our smartphones today are all Chinese phones. Okay, let, let me answer the two questions. It's really interesting. I, I've given several talks here in India over the past few days, and this question about essentially the health effects of 5G have come up in, I think, every single talk. Really interesting to me because those questions rarely get raised in the United States. So there's a lot more concern about the potential health side effects of uh, 5G here. In the United States, I say the primary concern has to do with uh, a rising incidence in brain cancer. Um, but that has been around for a while and not necessarily just 5G. So I'm, I don't know anything about the healthcare effects, and I'll be happy to look into it over time. Your second question is about the broader trade war. And let me. Let me first give you my personal opinion, which is not any governmental opinion at all. I, as an economist, I like trade. I like lots of trade. I like more trade. <laughs> so that's my personal view. That's not the governmental view of the United States. It's also not the view of anyone and not any political party in the United States. Um, the concerns that have led to the trade war between the United States and China, I think had been building for decades. Um, and some of it has, a lot of it has to do with intellectual property protection. Um, there's a federal agency in the United States called the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, and they, every year they, they have, uh, they publish a list of intellectual property thieves around the world, and there's, a, there's always a top 10 bad list every year for the past, not one year, not 10 years, not 20 years, but past 40 years, top 10, China's been on it just about every year. No administration has ever taken it seriously, um, and the current administration has, although I'm not sure it's necessarily the best way of dealing with it. The other thing has to do with what I would characterize as unfair trade practices or perceptions of that. Um, 
again, I, there, there should be ways of, of addressing these that don't involve, tr that don't involve tariffs. Tariffs are a very blunt instrument when maybe you need a scalpel. But that, this is kind of where we are right now. Um, great question, how this would affect India. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that the trade war will get resolved before long. Uh, it's harmful to both countries. There's no question about it. Yeah. Hello, I'm Pradeep. China, uh, in China, every company has to share the user information with the government. Right. Indian companies operating in China also have to share their information with the government. Any Indian traveling through China has to share whatever the individual leaders are with China. Okay. That way, you go to US, you also have to share your fingerprints. That's fine. But China has seems to be using the user information more than it has to fear the feeling. Fair enough, that's about the technology. But when it comes to the influencing the Indian government on such deals, long back, American companies have influenced the Indian politicians on some genetically modified brinjals. Okay. Likewise, China also can influence the Indian politicians on 5G. What's your view on this? Um, I, I, I can't speak to what China does to influence <laughs> India. I don't know. Uh, but I will say that the issue that you raise about businesses operating in China having to become agents of the Chinese government to suppress their people, to spy on their people, it is deeply troubling. Uh, and it has caused some American companies to leave China. Uh, Google, Facebook particularly come to mind. Other American companies have not left. Uh, and it's, let me just say, I've, I've talked to lots of American business people who, at the highest levels, who have operated in China. I can think of only one American company that really wants to be there. A lot of the rest of them wish they could find a way to get out. It's, 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 it's a very, very difficult place to do business. Um, but, on the other hand, it's a, it's a, a very important economy and uh, businesses feel like they have to be there or, or else their competition will be. But it's, it's got to be, I think it's got to be very difficult to be a business executive in China from any country and have the Chinese government tell you, uh, we want the information that you have about that person. I just, I don't know what I'd do. Actually, I know what I'd do. I'd get out of there. If you were the president of America, <laughs> what would, what stand would you take for in allowing imports of Chinese technology on 5G? Um, I, I do think there are the two issues that I, I mentioned that are, are complete bipartisan support which is how do you deal with intellectual property theft? How do you deal with unfair trade practices? Um, and I think the answer is I, I wouldn't do tariffs. Um, but I'm not sure I wouldn't. And there's a third issue which has to do with the way that software embedded in um, a certain company's products has lots of back doors. It, it is the most easily hacked equipment in the world. Uh, and it's designed that way. Uh, and, and the concern I have is frankly not so much the Chinese government is going to do something with it. My concern is some terrorist organization is going to use it or some hacker or so, it's just it's just an invitation. So I, I do think there's something very seriously wrong with they're in products uh, and, and they've been asked for years, for over a decade, to, to get rid of the security 
problems and, and they just simply refuse so far. Sir, uh, I would like to ask you about the health safety aspect. I'll give you one example. As the group lies 600, 600 meters from here, there's an apartment building. And uh, within a radius of 150 meters from that building, there are 37 cases of cancer. Seven of them are fatal. Uh, I personally feel that IG should be restricted to say, fiber optic lines and should be banned in uh, residential areas. Again, as I mentioned, I, I have no specific knowledge about health care risks, but I, I take your concerns very seriously. Um, I, it's, I tell you, after this trip, I'm certainly going to look into it much more carefully. It is not a big issue in the U.S. right now, and it, it probably should be. Uh, I'm feeling on the head. I mean, there is much more to the head. One of the impacts of my was the whole environment because there are areas where uh, we found that bees are losing their navigation skills and stuff due to the technology and stuff. Uh, that's my first question. Second, uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. Uh, 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 more than human health, right? We are also having impact on the environment. Like yeah. animals are losing their navigation skills okay. and all these variations yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So how does 5G impact the environment? Second, you mentioned that it uses very high frequency compared to 4G and 3G. So we all the towers will be ubiquitous everywhere. How would that change the landscape we are living in? And my third question is, uh, nowadays when we talk about it, like India has 1.3 billion phones and everybody is you know, consumed in the phone. With 4G speeds, people are watching videos and how, and with 5G, which is thousand times faster, how do you see it impact humans socially? I mean, to begin with, we were social people, now everybody is so consumed in the mobile. Maybe yeah. we will not know who's sitting next to each other, all the families want not yeah. spend time as they should be, rather than being consumed on the phone. Okay, uh, on your first question about the environment, um, I, I think it's related to the healthcare concerns in a lot of ways, and I just don't know, and I'm happy to look into it, but I, as I stand here, I don't have any particular insights into that. Um, the high frequency density, uh, yes, there would be more dense transceivers, but they would operate at a lower power because they don't need to send a signal as far, they only need to send it 50 to 100 meters rather than two kilometers or something like that. On your third point about social interaction, um, I completely agree with you. Uh, my wife and I have a pretty large number of children. Uh, we didn't allow them to have cell phones until they could drive. So uh, they would come home every day from school and complain about, you know, they were the only kid in the class without a cell phone. <laughs> but, um, I, but having said that, 5G is not just about being able to download Netflix in two seconds rather than two minutes. It's, I think there are a lot of other applications that I think have a lot of social value other than just faster video downloads. Uh, hello, Yamadat. My name is Krish. I just wanted to know what exactly is the difference between the 4G and 5G. And also, what I heard was this entire cable network is going to be controlled by this 5G network. Is it, is it true? And also, why this Huawei was banned in USA and why there are so many restrictions that have happened in US? Well, if I can remember all your questions, the first question is, how is 5G different from 4G? Um, the, the simple answer is faster speeds, greater, band, greater data capacity, lower latency. But there's a, a lot of details on the standards. There's an international standard setting body called 3GPP, and they're meeting all the time to develop the 5G standards about how 5G will operate. Uh, and it's, at the end of the day, it is 
faster speeds, greater data capacity, lower latency on transmissions. I've already forgotten your next two questions, I'm afraid. Could you repeat them? Regarding this cable network, is it going to be totally controlled by the by this five? We have a cable network in India. Yeah. Which runs. And also I, why this Huawei was banned in US? Why they have been put so many so many restrictions on that company? Uh, the second question about the cable network being controlled, uh, I don't know. It's a, an internal Indian matter. I just don't know. On the question of why was Huawei banned, first of all, it's just the network equipment that's been banned. It's not the components, because Huawei components are everywhere. But the network equipment was banned primarily for security reasons, that the Huawei equipment was built in a way that's very easily hacked very easily taken over by other by parties that might be hostile in ways that other network equipment is not. So that's, that's why and it, it was first banned in 2010 under President Obama. Yeah, you come back. You're good. Yeah. My name is uh, Maharshi. I have uh, two questions. Uh, uh, 5G is uh, about increased bandwidth and that makes it uh, difficult to spread it across the country. Uh, and India being a country with largely uh, agriculture based uh, population or it is living in the villages and right now the 4G is not uniform in the network and there is already a huge uh, digital divide you know, there is a tiny 5% urban English educated population which is highly uh, digitally highly literate but uh, uh, you know, very uh, bad uh, digital literacy in the countryside. And when 5G is implemented, where autonomous vehicles, the drone taxis, and you know, remote operations, robot, remote robotic operations and all these kind of uh, high-end uh, services will come into effect. So, do you, uh, what's your opinion about the increased digital divide and how this entire village population which is right now not getting farm jobs, how can they adjust to the, uh, this particular technology? And secondly, second question is about uh, the, the byproduct of 5G is enormous amounts of data. And this data, and so what about this data? I mean, data is the property. You know? If you uh, translate it into real estate, it's like a property. So who owns this data? And what about this data localization concept? Thank you. Those are two great questions. Uh, the the answer to the first one about kind of a digital divide where you have maybe 2G and 3G in rural areas and you have 4G in urban areas like Hyderabad, um, that's, uh, that's not unique to India. It, it goes on in the United States and in other countries as well. Um, what I would say is a couple of things though. First of all, Having even 2G is such an advance over having nothing um, that people in rural villages are so much better off with even just 2G uh, than they were with nothing. But the second thing I would say is that 3G and 4G actually will get to those rural villages. Uh, there's absolutely no reason that they ultimately won't. The diffusion of new generations of wireless technologies always begin in cities, but over time they spread. I think that's going to happen with 5G as well, uh, although I would say that the uh, higher frequency, after the millimeter wave band usage, um, that may be limited to urban areas simply because of the density of networks that's required. 
But I don't think that's a wealth, poverty distinction. That simply is the physics of how far a millimeter wave network can go. Your second question about private, about who owns the data, I think that's a really profound question. Uh, it's something I've thought a lot about. Um, uh, and I think it's kind of, uh, I think there's a generational divide. I've noticed that young people my children's age um, don't really have a lot of concern about sharing information or other people taking their information. I find that people my age have a lot more concern about the privacy, have a lot more concern about who's going to have access to all this information that's being generated. Uh, I don't think there's just an easy answer. When I was in Delhi, I talked to various people. I understand there's legislation before Parliament on privacy. Every country around the world is grappling with privacy issues and how to deal with it. Um, the, country, the, the groups that have been out in front on it have been the EU with their GDPR. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. California recently passed a law which is 10 times worse than GDPR. Um, it, it's really hard to strike the right balance. Uh, and um, uh, I, I'm, I, the one thing I'm convinced of, I think India can do far better than either Europe or California. That's actually a very low bar in my view, but I, I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't say just imitate them. You, you can do much better. Good evening, So you being the only economist who served on the FCC, could you just share some insights of your experience with the FCC? Any anecdotes you might share with us? I believe you had a very interesting job there. Uh, first of all, uh, let me note that the current chairman of the FCC, Ajit Pai, his family is from very near Hyderabad. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm actually going to send him an email later tonight sort of saying I was in Hyderabad and uh, how wonderful it is to, to be here. Uh, the FCC is uh, it's a great institution. Uh, it has uh, a lot of responsibilities, um, and uh, it generally works pretty well. Uh, occasionally it makes mistakes, like everyone. Uh, but uh, I would say, I would say that Chairman Pai, is, uh, he, he's been an outstanding chairman. He's done a lot of wonderful things, and uh, will continue to do great things at the FCC. My name is Venkat Singh Vasudevi. Uh, quite fascinating uh, lecture. But, uh, uh, as an economist, you would probably throw some light on two broad questions which I would like to ask you. One is the previous US governments had uh, put down the TPP as specific. Yeah. Whereas, uh, uh, Trump just dumped it in the trash can, in the sense he didn't want to be a part of it. Then he's trying, he's in his own way, a very disruptive, diplomatic offensive against uh, China and others. Uh, how, how, uh, and China was trying to revive the TPP with other nations. Who do you think will win ultimately? Whether Trump said, Trump's policy is a short cycle, the long run the US may lose. But as an economist, perhaps you can throw light on that. Secondly, just a short question. Um, the technological uh, competition between the West and the China, who do you think will win ultimately? It's a very good question, Mark. Uh, do you think an open society like the U.S. and the European companies will ultimately win on a controlled uh, uh, economy power like China? Yeah, well, let me answer the 
second question first, because I've actually thought a lot about this. Um, and it's not a question, first of all, it's not a question of uh, a national technology. Technology has no national identity. Technology is technology. Technology is information. It doesn't belong to a particular country. The big winner with technological change, uh, in my view, are, are consumers. Technolo technological advance helps consumers. It helps consumers around the world. Helps consumers here in India. It helps consumers in China. Helps consumers in America. Helps consumers everywhere. One of the reasons I think we've had such enormous technological advance in the past 30 years is precisely because the wireless industry has developed with minimal government involvement. It has been a textbook example of what can happen if you let technology develop without the heavy hand of government, whether it's network equipment, handsets, applications, wireless service providers, all across the board. 5G is, to some extent, a test of whether a government can actually influence technology. Historically, there are not a lot of good examples of governments actually being good at technology. Every government, including the American government, has tried from time to time to be the developer of technology. But ultimately, technology is developed by bright on engineers, ambitious entre uh, entrepreneurs, and people who just want to make something better. Uh, and, and the private sector, in my view, has historically been much better at that than the government. We're having a test case right now. Can a government, in this case China, break the mold? Can they actually advance the most in my view, most important technology through government intervention? We'll see. I don't know what the answer to that is. Your first question about TPP and trade and China. Um, look, I, I, as I said, I'm all in favor of more trade and more trade and more trade. Um, but, you know, the, I, I wouldn't necessarily equate Treaties is necessarily being the same thing as, as trade. Uh, there, there, there can be very big differences in that. American businesses doing business in China for the past 30 years, it's, and I suspect Indian companies doing business in China as well, it's, it's, uh, it's not exactly a free and open market, I'll put it that way. And, and so, how do you get there from here? How do you get to really free trade? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, but that's not something that I'm, I'm an expert in. Just a few more questions. Okay. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, uh, a company like Goham is, is well known for investing, long, uh, investing a massive amount of money in research for in areas, in areas such as 5G. So when America had banned Huawei, it also pressurized other European com European countries to ban 5G. So if uh, if a majority of European countries had banned 5G, how much delay would be would Europe experience for bringing 5G into their continent? I, I think you mean did European countries ban Huawei? No, so, uh, I meant that if. If a majority of European countries had banned Huawei, yeah. how much how much delay would the entire continent experience in bringing 5G into their country? But the opposite has happened. Uh, the opposite has happened, which is to say, I don't think there's any European country that has banned Huawei. So uh, if they had, if they had banned it, so yeah, how much delay would, would there be? Probably none. They just get to a different vendor. They might pay more, but it's not a delay issue. It's a cost issue. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. 
Uh, my question is regarding the Chinese government's political and diplomatic uh, pressure on countries that do not adopt Chinese technologies like Huawei's 5G. I'm thinking of Canada's case where uh, uh, three Canadian citizens were arrested uh, when uh, the Huawei CFO was arrested uh, because right. of the US request. And just today, uh, China warned India of uh, economic repercussions if they don't allow uh, Huawei in our country. So today the question is not as much as technological, as much about technological adoption, but also about geopolitics and international trade. So how does that play into the way countries access uh, new frontier technologies? Um, I, I think you make a very good point, and this is why a lot of what goes on is not quite free trade in a lot of ways. Uh, when, when governments get involved, when governments uh, say, we want the trade outcome to be a certain way, not because of, not because of uh, enforcement of existing law. So a country can have intellectual property protection laws, and they sort of say, we're going to have trade, but we're going to enforce our intellectual property protection. Or we, they can say, we're going to have free trade, but we're going to enforce our security laws. But when you have governments that are kind of involved in um, uh, tactics that are not directly tied to the legal structure, then, uh, then I, I think that leads to serious problems. Um, so when, when countries threaten India, or countries threaten China, or countries threaten the United States and say, our threat is not related to the rule of law. Our threat is related to some outcome, political outcome, then you know, free trade is, is not, not in a good situation at that point. Um, I, I'm a big believer in the rule of law. And, and, uh, it, but other than that, keep the government out. Uh, so uh, uh, so it, it's, it's very disturbing if governments are threatening India, you know, one way or another. And so that, that's probably not a good thing. Last question. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm extremely sorry for coming late for your meeting. Uh, but since 2017, I have seen two technologies uh, saying that we will be the first to bring by the Indian part, but none of them have come maybe by next day. Uh, my concern is currently people are not able to use 4G properly. So, what can we do with 5G? If you see, uh, India in compared to even uh, South Korea, the awareness of what kind of investment plan they should take, how they should take, they are not using 4G properly. So I don't think there's any benefit. And uh, the, uh, another point, every time the technology, whatever is invented, is creating 10 more problems than a solution. So <laughs> it's something attributed personally to Albert Einstein. So do we really require 5G? And if 5G comes, if it is not going to be used for creating more peace and prosperity for all the world, what is the use of 5G? Thank you. Um, uh, look, when, when every new generation of wireless technology has been introduced, there have been questions. People have asked the same questions you have. Do we really need 2G? Isn't 1G good enough? Do we really need 3G? Isn't 2G good enough? And so on. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, technology advances, and people at some point decide they want the new technology. Um, you can go into any, you can go into any shop in Hyderabad, I'm guessing, at least you can go into any shop in Washington, D.C. You can buy any type of 4G phone you want. 
you can't buy a 1G phone. They're not offered for sale. The reason they're not offered for sale is nobody wants to buy them. Uh, the question on 5G is not whether it's going to come to India, it's when it's going to come to India. And when it comes to India, I don't know, there still will be 4G networks, there's still going to be people buying 4G phones, but there probably won't, at some point there won't be people buying 2G phones. They're just going to become obsolete. And it's not a decision that companies make, it's not a decision that the government makes, it's the decision that individuals make about how they want to spend their money. And the way they want to spend their money is they want to get the latest technology or something close to the latest technology. That isn't to say, I mean, your point that people don't take advantage of the full range of capabilities of 4G today and why do they need 5G, I, I'm sure you're right. I, I, I'm sure I can absolutely guarantee you my children and your children know more about how to operate this device than I ever will. Um, and they, they run circles around me. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that when a 5G phone comes out, I'm, I'm going to be in line to buy one. I'm, I'm really curious to see how it works, even though I know I'm not going to be able to use it to the full extent that, that my children will. Okay. Actually, um, when, uh, Apple refusing to cooperate with US government regarding the decryption detail phenomenon. Uh, whenever this topic comes up, uh, why is there so much approach when national surveillance programs are happening in US? If it's not good in the national interest, why is there so many intellectuals against uh, US uh, government surveillance? In democracies like India and US, is it that, that shouldn't be a problem? Right? I'm afraid I just didn't quite understand. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the uh, government surveillance program. I mean, government usually, like in, even in the US, uh, US has asked Apple and other companies to provide a decryption detail so that they can uh, spy on uh, mobile communication for the of, of citizens. Especially of, uh, when it comes to terrorist threat and all, this is such a good uh, method, right? But why people are, I mean, lot of intellectual groups are against it. It's talking about government surveillance programs. He's saying that the US government is asking Apple to provide the details about the uh, customers and others. Yeah. Government surveillance programs. Apple. Let, let, let me make a couple of points. The US federal government is pretty technologically backward. They know about as much about this as I do, which isn't very much. Um, the US government doesn't have massive programs to, um, to surveil on citizens. And when it inadvertently captures information about people, the American public goes wild in, in just outrage. The example about the FBI asking Apple when there had been a terrorist attack in Los Angeles to, to be able to unlock the Apple device. It was, it was a defining moment in illustrating how absolutely technologically incompetent our government is. Because the first thing that happened was an FBI agent tried to hack into this iPhone to, to get the information. And of course the FBI agent couldn't. And actually, if you try to hack into it, what it causes the iPhone to do is to practically disintegrate or something. The FBI went to Apple because they had, the suspects had killed themselves. They had no access to it. They went to the apartment. They found the iPhone. They wanted to know if there was information on there about motives or other people who might have been involved. Legitimate criminal investigation. The FBI completely blew it. They went to Apple. Apple said, uh, you know what, we're, we're no, <laughs> we're not going to help you. We're not going to help you in a criminal investigation involving a terrorist attack. The FBI instead went to 
an outside party rumored to be an Israeli company that was able to hack into the iPhone in about 30 seconds or so. So um, I, I think the whole example illustrates, really illustrates two things. One is the US federal government doesn't really keep track of, doesn't surveil the American public. They had no idea about any of this. And then when they actually were faced with a specific technological issue about how to unlock an iPhone, they did everything exactly wrong. <laughs> it was, so that's, that's the American federal government that, that we're dealing with. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I wish I could tell you, they, if this were China, no way. No way they probably would have thrown these people into some gulag before they could do any harm because they control everything. But if they ever committed some act, the Chinese government would have hacked into it immediately because I don't believe for half a second that the Chinese government hasn't figured out how to hack into an iPhone. They, of course they know how to do that. Of course they do. The US federal government doesn't.